Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello, lovely listeners. It's Shana here from the Twinkle Talks EYFS team. And today we've got a really cool episode with the lovely Julia and Louise from our CPD Early Years team talking about risky play. Now, as we are talking about risky play today, we thought we would do a little segment before that asking you about what you would consider risky or what you are afraid of. So we're going to kick off today's episode with our Twinkle Talks top three fears of early years practitioners. Let's have a listen. Okay, so 157 of you took part in this vote and it's quite interesting. We had a couple of different options. Spiders, a lot of people said. Heights, afraid of the dark. Snakes, rodents, moths. I know someone in my family who's terrified of moths, so I get that one. Clowns, honestly, they are my worst fear. Like I have nightmares about clowns. I don't understand why they're at kids' parties. They are terrifying. Um, and other things like the sea and dogs and things like that. So according to you guys, the top fear of earliest practitioners is spiders with a massive 33% of the vote. I am with you. I'm sorry. If it's got more than four legs, it's just, it's too many. It's too many. Why do you need more than four legs? No. And you know that time of year when you're just sitting in your living room, like watching telly and then all of a sudden a monster darts out from under the sofa yeah no not having it nope nope i'm with you on that one we actually had joint second place as well so in 19 percent each of the vote your second place top fears are heights and snakes now i didn't used to be afraid of heights until i got covid and then as a symptom after that of long covid i had vertigo for about 18 months yeah no that is real like i could not feel my legs it's the it's the worst feeling no no and snakes totally again i'm totally with you like they are they are murderers guys they are terrifying no no isn't there like that movie where like it comes out of the toilet or something i'm just terrified that you know a snake's gonna come up and bite my bum no i'm not having it no i'm with you and then in third place is rodents with 12 percent see i'm conflicted I think mice and rats are quite cute. I mean it, like, especially living in the country and I live right next to a farm and so we get a lot of country mice. I think they're quite cute. Am I the only one? Maybe. I'm most surprised that clowns have only got 5% of the vote. Guys, clowns are terrible. Did I not make myself clear? Clowns, horrendous. No, I can't do it, no. But hey, it's not me in charge of this vote, it's yours. So those are your top three fears of early years practitioners. Thanks for taking part. So now on to the main part of the show, we're going to be chatting to Julia and Louise about what risky play is and how we can develop it in our settings. lovely Julia and Louise or should I say Louise and Julia usually I start with Julia first I'm sorry I'll start with like Julia Lulia oh god it's our official yeah. nickname your official n- I'm sorry it's gone out of turn <laughs> uh, it's just not like catchy guys it's fine whoa it's we've fine. got t-shirts we've got bags we've got mugs I'm not sure I what you're talking about I didn't get any of this we're, they're in the post <laughs> oh I see you've made like a proper little little group going on here yeah, I see I see how it is well hi Lulia lovely to have you back Today, we are talking about something very interesting to me. It's risky play. Mm. I know. I love a bit of risk. 
in the early years. But I think a lot of us, I think it's quite polarized. It's either mm. you do it a lot in an earlier setting or you're too scared to do it. Yeah, it's tricky. Right. And there's that balance. And I think I think that's the same for me in terms of what the balance is of, you know, not letting them run wild, but also letting them run wild, you know. So <laughs> I'm glad you're here, especially as the weather is getting much better. And I think mm. risky play outdoors is going to be more prevalent, mm -hmm. uh, which will be exciting. So first things first, what is defined as risky play? So risky play is seen to be an exciting activity that involves a physical risk and provides an opportunity to kind of test limits and explore children's boundaries, such as climbing, balancing or swinging, for example. And that's a couple of examples of risky play. But it's really just allowing children to understand and kind of explore that risk, because that's really important for them in later life. Why is outdoor physical risky play so important? It's so important for children because it's a chance for them to kind of challenge themselves and also judge a situation and then consider their actions. Because if we don't let them have those opportunities, they've always been told what to do, or what they can and can't do, then it means that when they are by themselves, that's quite a surprise and they don't know how to navigate those moments. So it's really important for them to kind of learn their limits and learn how to keep themselves safe. Actually, that's what risky play helps to do. Mm, because like you say, being kind of left to their own devices, are they able to identify and manage and understand boundaries as well, I guess? But that's like social and emotional skills, I suppose, as well, isn't it? Oh, definitely. And that that's something that they learn in lots of different ways. Like you say, you know, if their friend is being hurtful towards them, that's something that they'll learn to develop. Like, how should friends act? How should we learn to be with each other? And it's the same for physical risks. You know, if they see that something is risky, maybe, you know, they'll think about conversations they've had with adults and how to stay safe if they're climbing a tree, for example. And it all helps them later down the line navigate risk better. Because as an adult, if you've never experienced risk, then at one point you might be kind of let out of that, you know, bubble and then almost be crazy risky <laughs> and try absolutely everything and then hurt yourself because you've never been able to experience that. So that's what we're trying to avoid as well. Mm. And I guess, like you say, we can't we can't bubble wrap children like there are risks in life. And it's just like you say, getting them to recognize it and manage it themselves, which is what we all we all hope to do by the time we're adults. Right. <laughs> Definitely. okay so what 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 other skills do children sort of gain by learning and practicing risky play I mean there are huge benefits for risk for risky play and um for, for young children well not just young children for for children and and adults actually so so some of them could be feeling more confident willing to take risks and having a positive attitude about testing their own boundaries. I think Julia just mentioned that earlier on. Uh, perseverance, resilience, feeling proud and satisfied that they've achieved something that they thought was maybe a bit tricky and that they, they've achieved it. So it's a huge sense of accomplishment in doing something that's a bit tricky. And then you've got sort of the problem solving aspects and communicating with others um, to collaborate and negotiate around around a, a problem. And then there's huge benefits for gross motor skills and um, in particular things like the development of proprioception. That's when it lets us know our, our body becomes aware of, of where they are and how they move and, and the strength of your muscles. So there's huge benefits. And obviously, there's all wrapped into all of that is the engagement of your whole body and um, the sensory feedback that you get from taking risks and exploring. Mm. I was going to say, there's just, there's not really anything that's not a benefit, let's be honest. Like, I was trying to think of all of the areas of learning, like you were talking. PSED, like you say, you're building relationships with people because... If you are going to problem solve or work as a team in whatever, you are going to have to learn how to get on with your peers and how to figure stuff out. Communication and language, obviously, I think is a massive one because in order to solve problems or take certain risks, A, you need understanding, don't you? And B, you need to be able to communicate things if you're doing it with other people. Otherwise, it won't work. Um, physical, obvious, very obvious one. But I also was thinking as well, I think it's a really interesting way from from the cohorts I've taught it's something that boys are drawn to maybe because of society or you know however um 
And that's how they engage with like maths or understanding of the world and things like that. I was one of the girls that loved it and still do. Um, so it's nice to see. Maybe girls are coming more into it now as well, do you think? Or I mean, I do think that's the response sometimes of adults surrounding girls because I've seen the same thing with some parents when I've been in settings, you know. It's kind of like, oh, you know, don't ruin your clothes. You look nice today uh... and be careful and things like that versus, you know, when you're with them and you put your waterproofs on, it's like, it's all right. Like it's okay to get messy and dirty. Mm. And I think it just sometimes depends on what you've heard from things. Because sometimes naturally, just in society, boys are encouraged to be a bit more rough and they, it's okay for them. And yeah, you get out there and you get messy and girls sometimes like, oh no, you sit there mm. neatly and tightly and don't get messy. So I think sometimes that comes across in some situations and that's really nice for us to encourage all children to take those little risks because then like we say, it's preparing them later for life as well, because there's there's always going to be risks and important for us to navigate them as children. And this is it as well. It's like, it's also, I think, something really important to be aware of as practitioners is that awareness of your cohort and what children are being consciously or subconsciously told, don't get messy. Hmm. Because then risky play, however you do it, maybe in your outside area or forest schooling or, you know, however you do it, that might be their opportunity to let go and be free, you know? And like, that's always something really important that it's very prominent at schools, isn't it? Or school settings or reception classes or formal classes that everything must be tidy. And I'm one of these people, all right? Because me and cleanliness, it needs to happen, okay? I don't like sensory play. I don't do it. I know, I know. I'm an earliest teacher and I, I was I love it. I know. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> like getting... Ne- mm, touch mm, no it's not just for you. me it's not for me however going out gardening and getting my hands in the in in the mud and the soil fine mm-hmm. so you, you I think it's also about in those risky plays exploring those different senses and textures and actually finding out what <laughs> I don't want to say tolerate but kind enjoy. of tolerate <laughs> enjoy all right let's say enjoy yeah 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 yeah. Um, but it's that whole that it doesn't really feel like formal schooling because in in school in classrooms you've got to you know present everything nicely and tidy away afterwards and all of this and in risky play in outdoor play or you know forest schooling it's more be at one be at one with the mess and you know and explore it rather than be afraid of it is that right Yeah, definitely. And the other thing, as you were talking, I was thinking, I think it's probably risky play and the importance of it now is so valuable. Because if you look back historically of children's play, when my parents were younger and and their parents, when they were at home and off to play, they were out for hours. Mm. They were being risky. They were challenging their boundaries. They were making rope swings that adults weren't necessarily around as much and gradually over time children's footprint I suppose and distance of going away from adults and being free like you said is much much smaller now Mm. so actually the involvement of what you can do in schools and settings to allow children those experiences of risky play is so important because worlds are getting smaller for children I really didn't think about that you're so right and especially with like technology and that as well isn't it Mm -hmm. it's a lot of children whether they choose to or it's just because of their um, environment you know they're usually at home watching Mm -hmm. television or playing with toys or on a tablet and playing games and that you know like you say a couple of decades ago that that just wasn't that just wasn't a thing so it's really kind of our social environment has really changed and that's really affected how we develop isn't it risky play is somehow not our responsibility but if we have that opportunity in schools let's do it because it's really important really important. so the next bit then risk hazard and challenge what's what's this all about what is this so as we've obviously been looking into risky play a little bit more in depth there are three words that really struck in our minds really and obviously people will have heard the term risk because they complete risk assessments in school oh yes we do and and so it's about understanding what what each of those terms means so risk 
is the possibility or likelihood that something bad could happen. So it's the possibility that something bad will happen that could cause danger or harm. Or death. Is it also death? So dramatic. I know. It's so or dr- death. I'm literally just thinking about our risk assessments because that's what it says, isn't it? It's like there's a possibility. You know when you do the risk assessment and it's like a one, two or three or something mm. and it's like possible risk of injury or death. <laughs> you are being the drummer in all caps or death. <laughs> So, so yes so <laughs> no you have to consider it and really I would be saying if that is the possibility you know and it's a high possibility you probably wouldn't be advocating that a child <laughs> would be doing that yeah all. no no sky dives without the rope in a nursery class yeah that sounds all right no I don't yeah. think that might that might not be suitable um <laughs> I think that's not so, suitable yeah. for anyone sky dives <laughs> yeah. so um <laughs> risk is the possibility anyway right then the hazard is something that can cause harm physically or psychologically. So that is things like fire, using a sharp tool, the hazard of what could happen to you if you were to use something like a fire or if you were climbing, what could be the hazard that's related to that. And then the last term is a challenge. So a challenge is something that can be demanding and tests your ability. So those were the three definitions that we were looking at, which then leads into supporting you as a practitioner, maybe when you're you're writing your risk assessments. Right. So what would you say is an example of a challenge then? Well, so a challenge would be anything that would test you. So that could be climbing a bit higher, maybe. Ah, okay. It could be... Like walking down... I know it sounds silly, but like walking down stairs, like that's a challenge because it's something that they'll do or they can do but maybe there's longer there's more stairs or there's steeper stairs so it's just that extra bit of we need to work harder yeah yeah if it's just pushing them a little bit more yeah Yeah. stretching them in a comfortable place right so if they have learned to go down yeah like you say three steps Mm. then six steps would be a bigger challenge for them or steeper steps would be a bigger challenge. or you know when they're like um they're balancing and they're walking across Mm. a makeshift you know bridge with the pallets and the beams and all of that and yeah and they just use a thinner beam Mm -hmm. is that that would be the challenge yeah right so it's like an adjustment to something they're already doing Mm -hmm. but just pushing them a bit more yeah exactly it's still like testing their ability and it's still demanding in a space that they haven't done it before and it's still something that's still interesting for them because if they keep doing you know those repeated behaviors which are comfortable for them and they feel more confident then that challenge is for example you're changing that resource you're thinking oh look here's a small thinner beam would you like to try this and that's a bit of a challenge right okay Okay, so I feel like risky play, outdoor play, all this stuff, it it obviously isn't something new to us. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, as practitioners, as children ourselves, we are aware of, you know, this style of teaching, this style of learning. So have you got any big hitters, big names out there that have talked about this? So one of the people that we were looking at was someone called Tim Gill. And I'm going to relate this back to the risk element um, in a moment. Tim Gill it was one of the researchers into the benefits of risky play and he co-created a risk benefit assessment oh. and this is quite widely used with people that work in the outdoors with young children and what he said was that children need to experience uncertainty because they need to adapt and learn from their mistakes. Mm. And when you're outdoors, it does enable you to become more risky through play and um, that children need that time and that space to feel in control and develop their sense of challenge and and how they would adapt to that. So he co-created something called a risk benefit assessment. It's very similar to a risk assessment, which people will be familiar with in settings. But the main difference of a risk benefit assessment is that it's a way of balancing the risks and the benefits of activities and experiences outside. So what you would be doing when you're creating a risk benefit is you would start with looking at all the benefits of an activity, for example, running outside or um, climbing or playing outdoor games in a woodland. So you'd be looking at the benefits of that activity for the child and then 
once you've sort of thought of all the benefits, you then weigh up what risks and hazards are involved in that and the potential um, for the risks to cause harm. So that's the main difference, really. It's including the benefits in the risk assessment so that it's not just fo focused on all the hazards and the potential to cause harm, that you are bringing in, OK, yes, those that that is the potential, but there are so many benefits as well to to doing that activity with young children. So yeah, I think that's really a really important distinction because I think from my experience, I didn't even know a risk benefit assessment existed. If I'd have had that, I think I would have felt much more confident at, at doing risky play because like you say, risk assessments are very focused on doom and gloom and very dramatic and yes, but what if this happens? What are you going to do about it? And of course, that's really important. You should always think about those risks and how going to manage them but if it's just that it kind of goes oh, oh is it worth it oh no we found another risk oh but what and it just makes you doubt yourself but if you have those benefits next to them say for example I don't know building a fire and then having marshmallows on the fire you know as an activity yes okay you've got to think about obviously the fire itself is a hazard we've got to think about uh, splinters in wood I know it doesn't sound like a hazard but it's a hazard you know splinters are a pain and like you say managing those things but then on the flip side of that what are they learning oh they're learning about how to safely be around a fire they're learning actual real survival skills about how to build a fire which is amazing they're making their own food with melted marshmallows that's great I love that they're having a com it's a social thing it's you know it also I can imagine you know you're learning a lot about science and about wood like why does it burn what you know different kinds of materials and there's just when you put them both together you're like oh yeah you know this is why we do this so it's not as scary mm -hmm. and I think that's really nice is there anywhere we can find this risk benefit assessment Lou? Well, we have um, created one and it is on site. So it has the risk benefit form. And then alongside that, it's got a breakdown of guidance on how to complete one. That is totally going in the episode's uh, description. I love it because then it's just we can use it straight away. I think I might do one for my garden. I know you see gardening Lou's face is like no Shana that's not what it's no, for no I do you know what I was going to say is actually one of the I think um I read an article somewhere which said the majority of accidents actually happen in the garden I can mm. totally believe that I mm, I mm, I have fallen I've, over several times yeah I was gonna say <laughs> I've slipped yeah. and fallen and you, oh. you're you're quite often carrying something aren't you on an yes. allotment and then you slip mm -hmm. and then you fall and you try and correct yourself gardening is risky it yeah is. but guys it's so fun and I know you but you do have to think of all the benefits <laughs> Exactly. We're not saying it's a bad thing that it's risky. It's risky, but we're going to do it anyway because, like you say, yeah, there's a risk benefit assessment that I could do. Funny story, right? I fell over the other day because <laughs> it's springtime, right? So I'm getting, and you know, I love planting fruit and veg, and I've got like 150 pots around my house. So I was getting my tomato seeds ready because I've got like 10 varieties of tomatoes, wow. right? I know, I know, I know. It's ridiculous. So then I had about. 40 pots of tomatoes one in one seed tray one in the other and I was carrying one seed tray I was feeling mega proud of myself because I'd got all these seeds ready and I was like this is gonna be a great harvest this season stacked it all the seeds fell out all no. I know yeah all over the floor and I literally went no oh. <laughs> my babies <laughs> I was gutted <laughs> absolutely gutted and I was like scooping them in like no and they were different varieties, but they were all mixed up because I couldn't figure. And surprise. I was like, I'll just put them in. Yeah, the tomato in. surprise. Yeah, but you know what's really funny? I've got 21 tomato seedlings now. And guess mm. which seed tray they came out of? The one that I fell that I tripped over oh. or the one that I didn't? The tripped over. The one you tripped yeah. over. Yeah. Yes, That's they nature. are flourishing. <laughs> That's nature for you. Yeah. They needed, they they needed their, me. their roots being tickled a bit. <laughs> Roots being tickled. you know what, what I, I needed. Sometimes I need my roots tickled as well. <laughs> I feel it. But it's like one of those, I don't know, real life metaphors for risky play, isn't it? Like, yes, there was a risk I fell over. I got a bruise. Never mind. But look how flourishing they are. Yeah. And the, the other seed tray that I didn't fall over with, they're not doing nothing right now. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe See? you need to recreate your falling over safely. Shall I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just give it a little shake. 
a little shake. A All little right, shake. shall I just really slow motion fall over and see what yeah, happens? Exactly. And then yeah. put loads of mats on the floor. Maybe they're helping each other. They're like, Maybe. Oh, you're a different type of tomato. Mm. I'll <laughs> let you know what happens. Well, cause... we're coming to yours for salsa, clearly. <laughs> yes, you are. Salsa, the dance and the food. Let's exactly. do it. Exactly, we're salsaing while eating some. Mm. I love it. Right, we're going off topic. I apologise, <laughs> but I, I enjoy risky play and gardening very much. Um, theories. Theories. Talk to me about theories. Where did this come from? Why? It, who's who's some big people in there? Mm. Well, well, as we talked about, risky play is more new language than anything. We've always done it. Right. It's more something that as years go on, kind of things change and then we bring up new language to remind us of what's important. So one of the important people to know is also Ellen Sandseater. So she's a professor of early childhood education in Norway. And actually for her PhD doctoral thesis, she did scary, funny and all about risky play. So it was really interesting because basically she just found out that there were six categories of risky play. Oh, yeah, that really helps. I think practitioners and parents think about risky play in different ways. Yeah. So great heights such as climbing, jumping, balancing, hanging and swinging, high speed, So that can also be swinging fast or sliding, rolling down hills, sledging, cycling, those sort of things. Roundabouts. Yeah, roundabouts. (laughs) Don't make me vomit. (laughs) Roundabouts is a great word. Dangerous tools. So cutting tools such as knives and also, you know, things that people have been talking about. Woodworking tools. I love woodwork. You know, if you're working with ropes, you know, those are things that you need to be careful of. Dangerous elements. We've talked about fire, but also deep water or even, you know, pits and things that can be outside in nature and you have to be careful of. Like spiky plants and that as well. Yeah, Does that count? Right. I mean, it all poisonous. comes into it. <laughs> yeah. And okay. that's really important to be aware of. Rough and tumble as well, like wrestling, chasing, fencing. You know, you see a lot of play fighting. Kids enjoy doing that. And then disappearing or getting lost. So playing alone in unfamiliar places or exploring and wandering alone. So it's really interesting to think about those different ways of seeing risky play. Yeah, that's actually made it a lot more clearer in my mind, I have to say. I didn't even think about speed. I don't know why, but of course it is. I always remember in nursery, there was we had like in our outdoor space, there was kind of like a semicircle. So the children, there was a path that they could run. Hmm. and they'd used to play chasing games and things and there was always one kid who was incredibly fast and loved it but they weren't able to manage their own speed so for (laughs) I don't want to say for them or maybe for the other people that were playing with them running was risky play because it was like you don't know if you're going to get knocked down or not (laughs) so we were trying to teach them okay it's amazing that you're fast however nobody else is as fast as you so you need to manage the obstacles it's not their job it's your job exactly. so even yeah running can be risky play yeah and what great coordination that they have to develop because mm-hmm. I think there's, I think like you say there's always one that's faster than another and it's fine when you're by yourself running around <laughs> but when you put in a few more children into that mix then it does get you know a lot riskier <laughs> mm. And actually, I think it's really good to define them separately because Mm. you might make the assumption that if a child is great at uh, dealing with heights, you think, oh, they've got no fear, their risk assessment, their safety is fine. However, that's only one element of the risks. Actually, they might be afraid of getting lost Mm -hmm. because a child who might look so confident and can climb all those trees and can, you know, jump in that water or, you know, whatever it is if they're lost that's it and yeah. that's where they struggle and they can't look after themselves so I think that's actually a really good way to get to know our children more in terms of what are the different types of risky play and behaviors and how they feel in different sections is that yeah, right I definitely yeah. think so and how they lead to fears in adults sometimes as well because you might be thinking you know why are you scared of heights and then sometimes you think back to a childhood experience of when you were too high and maybe you weren't ready for it or you didn't feel safe in that scenario so it's really useful to think about the different areas to help children later yeah no I was just going to add that obviously part of this as well is that some children because they don't have fear of some of those elements particularly I'm thinking when you were mentioning the getting lost they wander and 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 they they have no sense of stopping Mm. so and that's part of our role 
as practitioners is to support them and 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 learn about boundaries because that that is a concern isn't it It, the other side of it is not being fearful but actually not having the awareness that actually I need to stop because I need to keep myself safe yeah yeah that's a really good point actually you're so right it's not just about what we're afraid of it's also about well actually do we understand the risks and the other that other side of the coin of understanding why some people might be afraid of it why maybe perhaps you should be like if a child's not afraid of fire (laughs) you're like "Mm, do you understand why though like you don't understand the dangers and how to keep yourself safe so yeah there's like two sides to that coin I like that so you were touching on that already uh Lou as practitioners what can we do in our classrooms in our settings in our forest schools to develop that love and acceptance of risky play and put that into our practice but also manage and support our children in doing it as well well there's quite a few different things that as adults that we can do I think one of the main ones to begin with is feeling comfortable in yourself as a practitioner and with focusing on the benefits of risky play and being being positive about it and and I think in a setting when you're doing your risk benefit assessment or your risk assessment whatever you choose to do and you're thinking about risky play is what you all feel comfortable with Mm. because everybody's got a different different level of comfort so some people might feel comfortable with children climbing really 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 high and other practitioners might not feel that comfortable so it's about feeling comfortable and as a as a team you'll be then able to positively support with their risky play and and being supportive with the language that you use as well and I think Julia's going to touch on that in a little moment a bit more in detail so then sort of weighing up the risk and the benefits around the ri- different risky play that that children are participating in so trying to enable them to do things and not prevent them and that's going back to the comfort as well and 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 agreeing with what you as a team feel comfortable with so you've got to consider the likelihood of serious incidents and injuries but also what the benefits would be from children participating in them and I guess if something is really risky and is going to cause hazards and you can't find ways to control it, to put control measures in to make it less likely that things would happen, you would choose not to do them. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so so being supportive of it, being positive about it, assessing it and weighing it up and, and completing your risk benefits as a team and enabling children to feel like they can do something and that they can take that challenge and take that risk in order for children to develop that trust with with you as adults as well that they feel trusted that and capable of doing something and lastly I would say giving children time Mm. where they can play and they explore and giving them freedom to be active in the outdoors because quite often injuries and incidents tend to happen when children feel really rushed and they've got to yes. do it quickly before before I'm going to be asked to go and do something else. Mm. So actually giving them time and space and that sense of freedom will definitely help to lower risks, mm. I think, and hazards because they've got the time to explore. And then lastly, I think I just said, and lastly, but one more thing because it's just popped into my <laughs> mind, is obviously reflecting on your environment and yeah. thinking about how your environment supports risky play. Does it support risky play? Do children have new areas that they can go and explore and hide? And does the environment allow for children to move quickly around it? Can children climb in the environment can they jump off the you know so really thinking about what does your environment offer children for risky play Mm. because research has found as well just to add on to that that if there aren't any ways for children to take risk they will find ways so better that you think about safer risky opportunities Mm. than they find objects to be risky with that you might not expect and that'd be actually more dangerous in that case that's a really interesting point isn't it risk is everywhere and children Mm. are curious and they don't know what's risky and what isn't they're just naturally curious about everything and yeah they might accidentally pick something up and put it in their mouth without realizing it's a poisonous berry or you know whatever 
because they don't have that awareness, but they are going to still try and find out because that's just what kids do. They're curious and that's good. We want to promote that. But like you say, it's about doing it in a safe way. And that's what Risky Play provides. I love that. That's really interesting. Just out of interest, just touching on your point there about plants. We've been talking about plants Mm. in outdoor areas quite a bit during this. And I think one of the key things for that is that you don't remove everything but you, you as practitioners, all need to be very aware of what plants and seasonal plants that pop up and go away. Um, and you need to develop systems and procedures in your setting to enable children to learn about the different plants. So if it is a plant that you don't want them to touch, how could you make that environment safe rather than just removing everything? I mean, sometimes you will have to remove things if you can't, mm. if you can't put control measures in. But for example, putting a cone beside it or putting a little sign that you've made or waving to the mushrooms or the fungi (laughs) and say, hi, I'm not going to touch you, but we'll just all say hello to it. So you're you're showing children that there is there is something there that they can't touch that you don't want them to touch. But if you remove them all, then when they're away from your setting, they won't have a clue what to do. They won't know. So, yeah. That's where your control measures and how you help to teach and to enable children to then manage their risks later on for themselves. I think we're we're picking up on some really interesting points here, because especially when we were thinking about risky play and the role of the practitioner, instantly my mind was right. You have to do this. You have to get rid of this. You have to make sure this doesn't happen. But that's actually only half the story. It's actually, well, no, don't get rid of everything if it's, you know, not horrendous. But it's it's just ma- controlling it and managing it in a way that is still safe. I think that's a really important point because I don't want our listeners to go away thinking, oh, my gosh, <laughs> there's weeds in our back garden. We must get rid of them. It's actually not that at all, is it? It's about mm. just identifying possible risks, possible hazards, possible challenges, making our children aware of them and then just teaching them how to how to continue life around them. Yeah, it's a learning opportunity, really, isn't it? It's like when I was younger, I learned very young about stinging nettles and how to recognise them because they were everywhere around where we lived. Mm. And, you know, if there was a scenario where they, I went to school and they just took them out, then I wouldn't have really understood what they looked like and be able to identify them as well as when we did because there, there would be a huge field of them actually next to where we used to play and they were just saying, you know, those are the sting nettles and if you do ever get stung, this is how you find a dock leaf as well to row yeah. And that's all just learning opportunities for the future to how to avoid risk in the first place if it's, you know, something you don't want to get hurt and then what to do if you do as well. So it's just, it's helping children, like you say, just navigate the real world actually yeah and I also think it's more it's also about understanding things more so when you were talking about the whole stinging nettle thing as well bees came into my mind Mm -hmm. because I feel like it's a common thing bees and wasps I am terrified of wasps I'm not gonna lie I used to be terrified of bees but now I understand them more I'm not at all and actually I love bees and I encourage bees to come into my my garden but like if we ever had bees at nursery or in reception watch the children scream watch them run watch them make a big you know Mm. kafor about it but that was just because either they'd seen someone else do it and that's what they thought you know we should do or yes perhaps one of them have had has had a bad experience and they have been stung which is completely understandable but that's only half the story a bee is actually a really beautiful creature and we need them to help pollinate plants, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to learn to appreciate bees. And it's not about as soon as you have a bee in your garden, kill it. Because my I had to spend so much time teaching my children not to do that because mm. that was what, you know, they they had been, that's what they thought was normal. It was actually about, well, no, let's let's just observe the bee from afar. It is a, it's a creature, so we need to respect its boundaries as well. That's why it stings. It doesn't sting for no reason. It's def- defending itself. So if we, you know, stay back, we're absolutely fine. And actually, bees are really important. And it's a good thing that bees are here because look at plants over there. There's loads of flowers. Can you see them having having some food? And they really understand how the world works around them as well. It's like, oh, actually, how something can be risky, but also in the right way, if used correctly and managed correctly, can actually be a massive benefit to everybody, right? Definitely. Definitely. I I mean, I think how you've just explained it really just shows the role of adults 
um, and practitioners mm-hmm. in Why, thank you. in terms of how you respond to things, whether it's with creatures or plants or risky play. I mean, if if you're in your setting and and you've got some steps up to a, I don't know, a, a climbing frame or something, and you all always, always stand there, go, <sighs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. then children will become naturally fearful of it because they're mm-hmm. seeing how you're responding to it. Mm. So, yeah, I think the role that we can all play, holding that in yourself, being aware of of what are the hazards and what are the risks and, and, and then thinking, OK, let's work together to approach this in a more positive way rather mm. than just seeing always the negative. Mm. And I think that links nicely to the language that we use around risky play, because I think that's something that's really important for everyone to reflect on and also think about what parents say as well, because children, like we have said, do mirror what they've heard around them, what adults have said. So if they're constantly hearing, be careful, be careful, be careful, they might actually start to feel a bit nervous when they're in those situations and then start to look for an adult and that actually can distract them from what they're doing. So often if adults are talking a lot while children are trying to do risky play, it can be distracting and can actually cause those accidents. So it's something just to be really aware of how much you're talking to children and what you're saying. Because if you are concerned, what can be really useful is just to make sure that children are aware of the risks before they do it. And also you can role play with people, you know, okay, if this child wanted to climb this tree, what what would you say? Do you need to say anything is also something to consider. And you can comment, for example, wow, you're so high. That's really impressive. Where do you think your hand or foot is safe to put next if they're not sure? But you can always leave that space for them if they look like they're thinking, because sometimes silence is really hard when children are doing something that you're not necessarily you know, you're concerned about, because it is something that you have to kind of almost get used to if you're not used to risky play. And then if they are starting to look for you, because sometimes they'll just be looking around themselves, they'll be looking for a safe place to put their hands or feet and you can see that. But then if they're not sure, then they might turn to you and ask and then that can be, they're introducing you into their risky place. So something to just be careful of what you're saying and how often you're talking to children when they're doing it as well. Mm, Silence is golden. That's what I like to say. Not too much though, because then that means they're like, they're in the food or something. That's why it's quiet. They're yeah, in, <laughs> suspiciously. Yeah. Quiet. yeah, there's a suspicious quiet as well. It's suspicious silence as well as a golden silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right, cool. So we've talked a lot and I feel like we've learned a lot. In terms of what our listeners are thinking, though, we've got a couple of questions. So we've talked about maybe children who have some fears uh, Mm -hmm. in terms of different risky play, or we have children who aren't aware of or seem to have no fear at all. What about our risk averse children, the children that just outright even refuse to engage with it for some reason? How do we support those children? Well, I think it's really important to talk to the children and talk to their parents because like we've said they might have got that from their parents saying no don't do that don't go there don't climb that and they might just be really anxious and nervous because of that and associating it with quite a lot of fear so it's something to really involve the parents in because it's natural for you know to want their children to be safe that's where it's coming from it's coming from a good place and so it's just trying to open up that conversation and what we talked about in terms of the risk benefit assessment is something really valuable to share with parents Mm. to show them what is the purpose because in their mind they're like why are you putting my child at risk (laughs) what is the point of this you know they're just worried about them hurting themselves but when you show them how important it is for their confidence for their physical development for them to navigate risk when they're not around I think you know that's really helpful for them to see the value and then that will help support the child as well because it's all about that kind of whole holistic understanding of the value of risk Mm, mm. I also think that parents they could give a really good insight into why a child is so afraid of something without any you know obvious explanation so for example if you are going to forest school and there is a big fire in the middle ready for marshmallows and without warning a child just 
is terrified, you think that's really unusual. If you go and talk to the parent, they could actually shed some light on maybe a really traumatic event in the child's life. And that could be really insightful and show you, oh, that's where that behavior has come from. Maybe this child isn't ready for this kind of risk yet. And I think parents give a really good insight to that because after all, you know, they know their kids best. And that actually answers the next question as well about what about parents? Because like you say, we as practitioners, either we've listened to this podcast so we now know what risky play is all about, or, you know, we've had training and we understand the risk versus benefits, but parents won't have access to our uh, a learning. So how, how do we support parents understanding why risky play is is needed and is safe for children to do? Well, we did think that was really important. And we have actually created an adult information leaflet to share with parents. And that can really help them understand the value and its importance and also start a conversation with them. Because mm. at the beginning, they might feel a bit nervous or avoidant to talk about it and just say you know it's okay that we talk about these things and it's really important that we do so that we can support children with them and also you know that language conversation is so so important start to help them thinking about what are you saying if they go anywhere near risks you know what have you said in the past what could you say instead how could you feel like you're supporting them whether that be a conversation about you know what is risky and you know how to help support children navigate that risk might help them feel more comfortable with their child doing that Mm. I always used to um invite my parents in because there was like a there in one of the schools there was a forest school attached to the school so we'd walk down and quite often I'd always say oh come along come with us come see yeah like come have fun it's honestly really fun <laughs> come come, come I, I know it sounds like we're doing you know crazy things but it's really and you'll see how we manage it and how it yeah, is exactly. safe and also I think observations I think are really good a lot of settings will have like online learning journeys where you know we can take photos and take videos I think if you actually did that when they were in forest school or doing risky play and showing them oh no look little Johnny finally tackled the climbing frame today after weeks of trying and found it really difficult but now he understands where his hands go and he can do it by himself Woo! like and making some of our ob- observations that we share with parents about risky play as well yeah definitely sharing those benefits and sharing the journey that they've been on is so so valuable love it love it okay last question from our lovely listeners we we do all this work right we we do all the work in terms of our learning environments our classrooms our settings our outdoor learning environments in in sort of promoting and supporting risky play but how do we keep that going out of the settings well i think something you know as well as sharing the value of risky play is you can always talk about specifics because I think when it gets super general parents would be like I mean what does that mean does it just mean you know when they're going down this massive hill on a scooter I just let them be you know like (laughs) they don't know how to tackle those day-to-day situations and risks and I think that's what's important you know talking about specific activities and you know how you could navigate those and also just opening up that conversation of you know maybe inviting parents into just chat about risky play would be really really valuable because I'm saying you know I'm cooking at home and, you know, they want to help and I just I just don't want them anywhere near the knives or, you know, the oven or things like that. And just kind of having those conversations about how can we navigate these these risks outside of the setting. I also think it's something to be mindful of that we don't want to put pressure on children to take risks when they're not quite ready to take them. Mm-hmm. So it's about building them up slowly and at their level and mm. at the rate at which they feel comfortable with. So that's where you, sort of the fine tuning of, of where you can support and when you step away is really important because if children feel pressure to climb up the big inflatable slide that's mm. really, really high and they're not quite ready, but they feel like they should be doing it because they've been told to do it, then actually it becomes not an adventurous and thrilling activity anymore. It becomes quite traumatic. Yeah. So I think it's taking cues from the child and then putting measures in to support them to feel like they can take more risks. 
That's a really good point. I think that's so important. And also breaking down the steps like you were talking about, because for example, because we see lots of things on social media and we sometimes see it near the end of the journey. So for example, a parent had their two-year-old cutting a banana and they were using a real knife and everyone was like, how can they be using a real knife? And she said, well, you haven't seen the journey that we've been on. You know, they've always wanted to help me. And, you know, we started with those wooden ones, which don't, you know, can't cause any damage and things like that and so it's a real like practice and they built up very slowly and where the child was at to a point where they felt safe with that risk and so like even just breaking down little steps of things that they might do because I think scooters are a big one mm-hmm. I think so many children scooted <laughs> to school or to nursery and some parents might be unsure about where is too risky for them or like what speed and things like that so breaking down little things about example starting with a scooter might be really interesting for parents Mm, yeah that's really good points thank you lovely ladies to play a game always yeah (laughs) i mean are you sure because that was like a little (laughs) woohoo okay that's much better that's much better just checking just checking okay so (laughs) obviously we are talking about risky play today and i thought it would be fun to have a look at our own feelings and experiences with risk because uh, i know because i mean we might seem like really normal tame ladies but we've led risky (laughs) lives And we're about to find out who has done what, basically. So for this game, there were three questions, all right? And like our episode last time, we've all answered them randomly and we have to guess who has done what. So the first risky play question is, what is a risky activity you would never do? One of them (laughs) was jump out of a plane like a skydive. Nope, nope, nope. Fair enough. Parkour and skiing. I would be a danger to everyone. Traveling at speed is not great for me. (laughs) Right, so who is skydive, parkour or skiing? Which one would you never do? I think Lou is skiing. Oh, see, I thought Lou was parkour because when we were talking about how, earlier about how we answer questions, <laughs> <laughs> Lou is a very um, notorious one-word answer gal. That's true. <laughs> so, that is true. I thought parkour might be uh, might be you, Lou. It's not me. Oh, Julia, it must be you then. It's definitely not me. Why would you never do parkour? I must say I'm a little traumatised from meeting someone that said he jumped from a shipping container to another shipping container and knocked out his two front teeth. And I thought, that uh, sounds oh my horrendous. God. I will never be doing parkour. <laughs> <laughs> this is what this was. <laughs> so you have put me right off. <laughs> mm, my teeth are tingling. Thank you. I know. That. I'm sorry cool. to share that story, but that was true. And he was there for some parkour competition And they all jump all over the place. And I thought, you know, for me, that is not very thrilling. I don't think I'm getting any benefits. So it just sounds like a lot of risk. (laughs) Fair enough. Fair enough. I just like saying parkour, though. So I will jump on a step and go, parkour. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know, the kids have started doing it at school now, even in reception. No way. (laughs) Whenever they jump, yes, whenever they jump down a stair or something in the up, they're like, parkour. And I'm like, you wish, babes, you wish. (laughs) Sounds like um, the children in re- reception are uh, at the beginning of their parkour. Yeah, all yeah. right, that's true. They I'm... might actually be doing parkour for their level. <laughs> yeah. They might be doing it better than me and they're three years old, for goodness sake. So, yeah, that's fair. Get involved in that risky play, Sean. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Go on then, Lou. Talk about skiing. Why not? I'm not very good at travelling at speed, really. <laughs> I... I, I, I... <laughs> I I used to be really good at running and actually I still probably am but running's not really the problem it's anything with like bikes scooters I would never go on a scooter because it really? just really yeah just feels a bit out of control is it because your feet's not on the ground is that what I, it is 
I like to have my feet firmly mm. on the ground. Uh, um, but skiing just there's too many elements involved. There's coordination needed, which I'm not great at. And then you're going down a slippery surface. Literally. Really, really fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd much rather the hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's waiting for you at the bottom. So <laughs> yeah. And then you don't have to climb or anything. I feel you. And also snow. You know how I feel about snow. Oh, yeah. So, since you don't really love snow. I hate snow. snow. That you no. wouldn't like skiing. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no. Because you end up in the snow quite a lot when you're learning. Right. Mm -mm -mm -mm. For me, it's uh, skydiving. I've completely forgotten about that one. That would have been... How could you... Oh, how could you forget about the most terrifying thing that anybody could ever do in their life? Jump out of a plane with nothing just to hold... Okay, fine. No! Yeah. But you have a parachute. Yeah, but what if the parachute doesn't work? You have like a backup, don't you? Do you? Do you? I think there's two. (laughs) There's two, is there? I think so. Are you sure? No. Right, exactly. <laughs> Literally betting your life on... Well, I mean, that's not true because I haven't done it. I haven't signed up for one not knowing if there were two. I just, I don't know. It just does not... Uh, I think I would absolutely wet myself on the way, and I mean literally wet myself on the way down out of pure fear, or pass out and just miss the entire experience anyway. So I just wake up in a puddle of my own wee at the bottom, like, what happened? It just does not seem... I don't reckon you could close your eyes, because aren't your eyes, like, forced open? Oh, stop! Ah! (laughs) You're forced to watch your death. (laughs) From the the wind. wind. Oh, no, you wear goggles, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, and also you just don't look good. It's like... I mean, it's not a look. It's not a look. But I don't think you need to share the video. <laughs> Fair enough. No, it's, it's just, um, no. Would you jump out of a plane? Would you do it? No. Right, there you go. Actually, that actually leads really well on to our next question, which is what is a risky activity you would love to do? So let's see what people would do. Okay, first one. I would love to do one of those massive zip lines or bungee jump things. Being attached by a rope is enough to convince me I won't die. Fair. Next one, I I attempted recently to ride a bike. Well, a tandem bike. Didn't end too well. I would like to buy a tricycle and go from there. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, my God. I kn- that is- First okay. one, Sean. <laughs> yeah. And ironically, oh. something you'd love to do is sky drive or bungee jump, Julia. <laughs> Why? We've just said how ridiculously terrifying yeah, it is. that's your opinion. <laughs> I think it sounds quite fun. <laughs> oh, I think Julia's just like the riskiest one of us. She's the rebel. Rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, literally rock and roll because... Okay, so I feel like there's a very big difference between skydive and bungee jump because bungee jump, you that's are fair. attached to something. Doesn't mean it can't break. Oh my God, stop. What happens if they've <laughs> got the cord the wrong length? Yeah. It's a bungee. It's, it, it, it's flexible. Yeah, it's meant to be flexible, oh, right. but yeah. it could break. Or well, the harness could break. Oh my God, That's stop. The risk. <laughs> That's on the risk assessment. <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll be on the risk assessment. Right, okay. Well, that's why I said like bungee jump or zip line because you're attached, but zip lining... You know when you do those, have you seen like on yeah. TikTok and things, those massive ones where they yeah. literally go for miles and the views. It's incredible. It's incredible. And it, I think it would just feel like you're flying. And I, I love think that I, feeling. I mean, I'd like to be yeah. a bird, but I don't really want to do a zip line. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different question. Yeah, it? let's go on to you, Lou, because what you consider <laughs> to be a risk is it's a tandem bicycle. <laughs> it's so a cute. tandem bike. <laughs> so cute Uh, I never really learned how to ride a bike when I was a child right and I had a bike for a while which brakes didn't really work so the only way to stop was just to fall off it so I spent a lot of my childhood (laughs) Um, and because I just didn't really I just didn't like the feeling of maybe I'm just not very good at balancing I don't I don't really know so recently I tried a tandem bike in Devon. How did that go? (laughs) (laughs) Well, really well, I thought, until Uh I realised, obviously I wasn't doing any of the hard work because I was sitting on the back. Oh, (laughs) So I was made to sit on the front. Oh my goodness. We ended up coming off the path and into a... (laughs) 
I just couldn't balance, steer, pedal, all of those things and apply the brakes. I couldn't do that. And they were shouting, brake, brake. And I just, I just couldn't remember where the brakes were. <laughs> oh. oh, I'm sorry. It's Although it's really funny. <laughs> it's a bit funny. <laughs> So tricycle's the only way now, I think. Okay, yeah. you'd love to, your, your risky activity you'd love to do out of the entire world. <laughs> Skydive, bungee jump, zip. No, no, I want to try. You do that's you, okay. babe. That's, that's your... You do you. Yes, it's You're risky right. for me. It's risky for you. Uh, yes. It sounds like it. I, Julia, let's not invite her to the next cycling <laughs> holiday. <laughs> to our crazy holidays. Yeah. <laughs> risky play holidays. <laughs> Uh, I have done risky things, but th- that wasn't the question, was it? Yeah, All right, that's, that's a true. bonus question. What risky thing have you done? Oh, is this for me now? Or is yeah, that the right next now. Question? If you're gonna, oh. yeah, if you're gonna put it that way, that's fine. You tell us. Come on, then. Well, you I've sure? walked across really high rope bridges in Nepal and places wow. with massive drops. With two backpacks on, like Ooh. massive backpacks. <laughs> so, Not one. No, I had two. I had one on the front and one on the back. Oh so I had to really balance and I couldn't really see where I was going. So I just had to trust that the, the bridge was safe. That's cracking. That risky. Yeah. Well done. I'd love that. Get you. I'd love to do that. Um, but that actually moves on rather nicely to our third out of four questions, by the way. There are four. I didn't oh, realize. I know. No. Bonus question. I what risk have you overcome your fear of? Because I think that's also a really important part of risky play, isn't it? Like you said before, Lou, it's about that achievement of going, yes, I can do things even when they're yeah. hard. So let's see what we did. Number one, I used to really be afraid of roller coasters, like full on panic attacks. That was until I actually went on one <laughs> and that fear had totally gone and I actually love them. Number two is I'm not great with heights at all. Although I have had to do this on my travels, so I guess when you need to do something, then mind over matter and trust kicks in. And number three, public speaking or presenting. Ooh. Mm. Okay, what have we overcome? I feel like, Lou, you must be the heights one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've, <laughs> and then Sean I've is the first all one. the questions, so I've just actually answered that one. Yeah, yeah you me. did. Yeah, sorry about that. Why are you sorry? Overcoming heights is a really... Yeah, that's hard. Is that a big challenge? Uh, I don't think I've overcome it. But you do it when you need to. But I've done... When you have... There's, there's only one way to go mm. and you have to go that way. You have to just mm. trust. And it took me a long time, but I got over that bridge and then there was another one. Oh, no. So, yeah. So you, I think sometimes it's not necessarily overcoming it. It's, I wouldn't choose to do it. I wouldn't choose to go and seek mm. it out again, not like the person with the roller coaster. Shauna. That's me. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, be. I wanted to put this because I think it's an interesting take on what risk is because I had this and I mean ingrained pure panic attack fear of roller coasters and I mean if I saw one I was good I was having a panic attack and it lasted for years and years and years and years and I'd never been on one so I had this fear of something without actually even having a bad experience of it it was just something that for me for some reason I just couldn't handle and then when I was I think it was when I was 16 or something I finally took up the courage and was like, just, you just need to get on it and do it. And I was so cross at myself afterwards because it was so fun. And I was like, why have I wasted so many years being afraid of them? They are so fun. And then since then, I mean, literally the fear has completely vanished. As soon as I went on one, it was like, boom, gone. And it was really strange, but it was that idea of the idea of the fear it was scarier than the activity itself. Mm, you build it up in your head. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, that's yeah. the power that sometimes fear can have on you. And that's why mm. risky play is so important because actually if you sometimes, if you just do it, it's like, oh, it's actually not that bad. It's just, I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So that was an interesting one. But yeah, Julia, public speaking as a, fi- as a fear you've overcome. Tell us. Oh, it's scary. I think that was always scary. The thought of speaking in front of lots of people. I think it just got to the point where I was like, well, I can't be doing this for the rest of my life. So I just started signing up to speak in front of people. Just had to keep doing it until kind of like worst case scenario is actually not that bad. Like worst case scenario, you're not very good. And, you know, you 
kind of trip over your words or you say a lot of uhs. And you're like, well, at the end of the day, people aren't going to be booing you off the, you know, the stage mm. potentially. So it's all okay in the end. And then you relax a little bit more. But I found that being more psychologically risky, I suppose, mm. in terms of, oh, going up there and feeling really awful and traumatized from it. Really vulnerable as well, mm. isn't it? Mm. It's like putting yourself on a platter for people to judge. And I think you're a very good public speaker. I mean, you've been on this podcast several times and I think you smash it, babes. <laughs> but I don't think it's the same. I think it was like more physical standing up in front of lots of people I think standing up is quite important because sitting down quite relaxed Mm. something about standing up in front of lots of people sat down feels very different and I don't know why yeah last question in our risky play game which is actually my favorite (laughs) what is an everyday risk for you that isn't a risk to others okay I'm loving this are you ready (laughs) okay one of them is I love to discover new places and wonder I have a good sense of direction that does not answer the question. So that's got to <laughs> be that Lou. Lou. That's definitely Lou. You didn't answer I was the question. I thinking, I don't even remember the question. No. What was the question again? What is an everyday risk for you? That isn't the risk, is it? Well, possibly. Apparently gardening is a risk if you keep falling over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think I read the question right. <laughs> Four questions is one too many Probably for just getting up in the morning <laughs> is just a risk. Everyday life. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, I'm so sorry. Everybody. It's all right, babes. That's why we love you. It's all good. It's brilliant. Right, Lou. You need to find out which one's for me and which one's okay, for you. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. For one of us, an everyday risk is driving. For the other, it's having a piece of toast. Um, this is really hard. I'm going to say driving, Julia. <laughs> toast, Anna. <laughs> Ding, 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 ding. Those two things are very different. (laughs) Yeah, see, driving, I could see why. But come on, Julia, why is driving an everyday risk for you? Well, I feel like it's risky because you can't control everyone else. That's a good point. So I always feel like, ooh, this is a bit risky because, you know, what if someone is, I don't know, looking at something out their window or on their phone? I'm like, ooh. See, I thought it was you saying you're a terrible driver. Like, everyday risk for you is driving because you're just, you're just bad at it. You just. <laughs> I try to be super safe, but you can't control everyone else being super safe. That's true. Imagine what would happen if Shana drove and ate toast see risky stuff (laughs) i mean do we really want to paint that picture because i mean you'll know why a piece of toast is an everyday risk for me you might be able to eat toast okay guys but for me is it the sound i am not doing a sound that is disgusting no no. is it the sound that you you don't like is it a risk yeah what's the risk the risk is i might poop my pants that's the risk i've got celiac disease i'm not having toast oh See, we did not know this. <laughs> we were like, what's going on? It's the risk is going to get burned. <laughs> what's happening? No, I can cook a piece of toast. I'm a good cook. I can cook a piece of toast. I'm not worried about the toast. I'm worried about me. All right. I, I don't know what's going to happen as soon as that thing enters my mouth. I see. Okay? It's risky. <laughs> and it's risky for everybody else who lives with me because let's just say they don't need to. They're not allowed. They can't go near the bathroom. All right. If I even make it that far, let's just no, no, no. Toast is. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Although I say that. Yeah. I have had a cheeky KFC once in a while. Risky. Yeah, I know. But I did a little risk benefit assessment in my head. Okay. And I knew I was going to be home alone. And I, I really like the taste. So I was like, you know what? Fine. If I'm on the toilet all night, it's worth it. Don't judge me, people. I did the assessment in my head. I took that risk. I don't think we can end it better than that. Yeah. What a way to end the show. Thank you so much for coming, you gorgeous ladies. I've learned so much about you. Uh, You've learned too much about me. That's fine. (laughs) Lovely to see you. And I look forward to our next one where... (laughs) Hopefully there's less poop talk involved. Bye. It's lovely to see you all. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank 
thank you for listening to that. I am really sorry. I have no idea how it ended on that note. You can tell that we were tired. Let's just say that. But they are so much fun. I hope you learned a lot as well. And don't worry, everything that we talked about is going to be in the episode description and we'll send you links to more resources and to more information if you want to learn about how to encourage risky play in your settings or in your home if you're a parent. So thank you so much for listening. Hope you had fun. (laughs) And we will see you next time. Bye. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today.